And now, um, without further ado, uh, please uh, give a warm welcome with me to Michał Staniszewski from Plastic with his talk, Diversity of Ideas. Uh, he said that this is a uh, uh, quite light and pleasant presentation, just right uh, for this moment of the day. Uh, so, fingers crossed <laughs> that it was true. Uh, once again, welcome on Digital Dragons 2016. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is uh, Michał Staniszewski from uh, Plastic, a small studio based in Łódź. And uh, I would like to show you a presentation that will be probably different from a lot of presentations presented today. It will be like very lightweighted, a little bit of abstract thinking. So I did it together with my friend uh, Krzysztof Kaniowski, uh, who is a um, um, lecturer at University of uh, Łódź from Faculty of Mathematics. Um, <coughs> okay, let's start. So the motivation be behind this was to answer some questions is like, is it uh, really hard to invent a, a new idea for a video game? So we can see that uh, most of the video games coming every day look more or less the same, which is actually a problem, especially for people at my age or older who already knew a lot of games before and nothing is new, uh, new for them. And developers, have this problem that they don't look too often for other medias like movies, theater, shows. They stick to the games and try just to move around the games and, and, and that's an issue. So there's a need for a mental exercise, a small thought experiment. We can discuss it after the, the talk if it will work for you or not. And so we, uh, together with my team, we've made a game about a ballerina. And after making that, I was thinking that it's really hard to find another game with a dancer as a main character. And I really tried hard. It's like digging through old games and so on. And I, I haven't found any, with, uh, any game with a dancer with dance being one of the most important things of, of, of that game. Um, of course, I found games with dancing where dancing is a main mechanic, so like uh, Dance Dance Revolution and so on. There's like a lot of those games. But there's, there was no single game with a dancer as a, as a character. And it's like, what's going on? So dance was together with people from the very beginning. Like we, could, uh, we can find uh, pictures in caverns about the dance. So what happened? And Okay, so, so this, this uh, I was thinking about that we can try to think about those ideas in a different way, in a, some uh, kind of abstract way, and it, this will be a good uh, thinking before after party. We can talk about it after, uh, on after party because I was doing this presentation before and I had a really good positive feedback about, about it. People started to think and they started to think out new operators and, and new stuff and I thought that it would be good to like make a presentation once again with a lot of new stuff. So let's start to think about ideas in a more abstract way and this is like a little bit of philosophical, philosophical rambling so not all of this stuff is entirely logical and some of them are really bogus. The, the last presentation had a really big bug but, but I, I think that I fixed it. But um, we can argue about that. So the, uh, let's go to the mathematics. It's, it's a mathematics from not the primary school, but um, like the high school. So we have the set of real numbers that represent all uh, numbers on one dim dimensional set. And uh, it's like uh, the, the number of those numbers is infinite but they're uncountable, so you just can't write them on, on any table or any paper uh, because it's impossible. So let's uh, asso associate every idea with a number, like map them. So th there's a lot of numbers. I'm, I'm using the, for my slides, I'm using like the stars and galaxies because <laughs> I, I thought it would be a good idea to connect that because there's like a lot of uh, stars and I think there's, there's a lot of ideas, but a lot of those are not 
yet discovered. Okay, so let's start from the very simple thing, which is the prime idea. And this idea is presented to all of us in a natural fo form uh, based with the human evolution. So, for example, if I was talking about those cavern paintings, um, someone invented that, and when the first painting appeared, the other ones were thinking that, whoa, it was really cool, and they started to, to use it. And those things happen by evolution. And in my, uh, in my opinion, every art form is being created just because of human scientific advancement or exploration. So, for example, we haven't seen jungle, we didn't know that it exists. And there, then the first man arrived and has seen the jungle, and he said, that there is a jungle, and <laughs> you need to see that. And uh, then our approach, like uh, horizons, has broadened, and we could add jungle as an idea. So let's assign a prime number to each natural idea, like two, three, five, seven, seven, eleven. Those are prime numbers. It means that there are that they can be divided only by themselves or by one. And th this is like a very simple example, like let's say that two is a dog, three is a car, five is a desert, seven is a modern art presented as a, <coughs> as a pa uh, painting of Mondrian, and there's like infinite number of other primes, and then there's like a very distant prime which was discovered recently, these are like gravitation gravitational waves that were proven to actually exist based on the theory of Albert Einstein that's 100 years old. And those, there is infinite number of those, but they are still countable because the, the prime number set is countable. It means that you can write them then on, on a piece of paper. It will be like a very long paper, of course, but you can do that. And then let's present the mixing operator. So we have those prime ideas and we would like to mix them. So like, let's take doc, which is two, uh, multiply it, it's like a product. So let's say multiplication by desert and we have a doc on a desert. It's pretty obvious. <laughs> and then let's say that every number has a unique factorization. So 10 is not a prime number, it's a natural number. We call it from mathematics, it's a natural number. It's a combination of prime numbers. And every natural number, let's, let's say like 120, has unique representation made of prime numbers. So, for example, 3,553, it's 11 times 17 times 19, and nothing else. So you can't make this number from other numbers. But this was simple. Let's take a, a different number. It's like 120, so the factorizations look like this. For big number, the factorization is really hard to process. You need like a huge computers for that. But 120 is very easy, 12 by 10, 2. Then another 2 appears, 2 by 3. And in the end, we have 3 times 2, which is 2 to the power of 3, 3 and 5. So, for this factorization of natural number, we have the same prime number appearing 3 times. So we have a magnitude. And what we can say is like a magnitude of idea. And it's like make, make an example of ma magnitude of an idea. So, so this is like an old western when uh, uh, someone has shown a wound. So we can think that this person is wounded, so probably he will have problems, maybe he will die. But it's like a, let's say it's like a normal magnitude. And then, if we'll try to show the wound in a like m much more intense way, to uh, show, for example, the mental state of the main character, we have the black swan over here, then we use those, um, these wounds in a more exaggerated way. And in the end, we, if we like, magnified even more. Then we have this like Texas massacre, Chainsaw Massacre, which actually use wounds and um, damage or uh, brutality or uh, whatever you call it, in a such intense way that it actually creates a new genre, which is the gore. Okay, so let's present another uh, operator, and we call it the inverse operator, because it's, it would be nice to have so any kind of inversions for these uh, numbers. So let's take a rain 
let's say it's 11. So what will be the the first thing uh, the, the first thing that you will think about what should be like inverse of the rain. So maybe where the rain doesn't drop and the drought. And as in mathematics the inversion operator um, has a distributive property. It means that if you, if you have a multiplication of ideas like this dock on a desert, dock times desert, so you can put those inversions on every piece of that equation and it will work. So let's see. The inversion of dock, I think it's a cat. You, you can think differently, so it's, it's a matter of you. And inversion of desert is a hill with green grass. So multiplying that will give you a cat on a grass. So in other, in other words, you can have this like a very big idea made of those tiny pieces and you can invert just one piece or you can invert the whole thing. And an exercise, so Superhot has this saying time moves only when you move and try to inverse that. So time moves only when you don't move. It, it doesn't make sense. So from the me mechanics way, it may have sense. For example, if you have a platformer and when you jump on a platform and the platformer moves you, then you move and then the whole world can move and this is like a very important thing. So and, uh, you can take this idea and try to make some kind of u something useful from that. So basically you can take any idea of a game and try to inverse it. That's like a very simple exercise. And then we have rational numbers. The rational numbers are numbers that are the ratio between natural ideas. So we have two ideas, we, um, we divide it and make like a, a proportion from that and we, we have the number that's called in mathematics a rational number. And it's funny because you can say that it's, if something is rational then it's not insane. So it's, it still makes sense. And I was thinking about, I was trying to search that, uh, what is like the evolution of that word rational numbers and I couldn't find it. So if the first thing was ratio from like proportion or it was like a ratio from, from like the mind. Okay, and this is an example. So we have this jungle that I was saying before and we will divide it by sun. So let's take the out light out and we have a uh, night in a jungle. But it's still, it, these numbers are countable. So there's like infinite number of them, and, but they don't make the whole set of numbers. There's still something missing. And w how can we use rational numbers? So we can divide the ideas and try to get something out from them. For example, we have like a, frame, a first person shooter. We take out the guns and we have like the walking simulator like the raster. So how, how, how is it an evolution? So the frames person shooter were like from the start. And actually there is an evolution because like Dear Esther was, uh, um, was a game that uh, from, from that point there was several other games really good that evolved. And on the other hand we have like a racing game. <coughs> and if we'll uh, get the challenge factor from that then we'll have the Euro Truck Simulator when you actually don't race, we just drive. And is it, is it cool? It is. There's a lot of people that love that game. And then, if you, we, we've got the um, um, result from the previous slide, like taking out these guns from, from the shooter, and then if we multiply it by another idea, which is like the walkie-talkie talk, then we can evolve it to Firewatch, which is a game that I really strongly recommend. And let's present another operator which is, will be a little bit more advanced. <coughs> it's called uh, something that I call the shift operator. It means that you have an, uh, like a general idea and you would like to shift it to a, something like a, a little different place that haven't been explored yet. And we can say about it like a twist. So there's like a game with a twist. For example, like 11-bit studios has those games with a twist. 
So they have like the tower defense, which is inverse tower defense. And then there's a game about war, this war of mine, but they are not concentrating on the war in terms of soldiers, but they are concentrating on the war in terms of the victims. So this is a twist, like a shift in another other direction. Okay, so how it is works in numbers. <laughs> Um, we have this 120, which has, has this factorization. And if we will add 1 to 120, then we have this 121 number, which is 11 to the power of 2. And if we will subtract 1 from 120, then we have completely different factorization, 7 and 17. So, for example, like I was saying about this war of mine, this is like we take an idea about the policemen and we shift it to their wives. And we concentrate on the w their wives and then we think, that, okay, the wives uh, can suffer a lot when uh, a policeman will uh, like die during her, uh, his job. So we can think about that and make a game about it. So there's a tons of games about policemen and think about the game about policemen wives. And a great example of using this shift operator in movies is mov uh, the movie called The Room. Um, I will not spoil it too much because I will tell what's happening in the trailer of this movie. So this is a movie about, uh, <coughs> about a woman with a child that is held in a small room for a couple of years. And I, if you would normally see that movie, then you would think that, it's, that the whole movie is all about of getting out of this room. And it's not, because it's completely shifted, and I really strongly recommend that movie. But let's go to the next set of numbers, which are the irrational numbers. So there is the, those sets, there's numbers that called are Euclid irrational numbers, which is, um, sorry, <laughs> the Euclid said that irrational numbers are unsayable numbers because you can't write them down. So, for example, you have a square root of 2, you can write it down as 1.4, and it goes infinite. And those numbers are like unreasonable numbers. This is something that, this is an idea that does, it, it's so bad or, or weird that will not work. And there are algebraic irrational numbers and the other irrational numbers that I will tell about more later. But let's say let's stick to those algebraic irrational numbers. So these are those. So we have like a polynomial, and the roots of the polynomial are those numbers. And still, there's like a tons of these numbers, but they are countable. So the set is not full. And let's present a couple of those irrational ideas. So, for example, like glitch aesthetics. This is something that um, appeared recently which is really nice, in my opinion. <laughs> so basically, you display the graphics in a very glitchy way. So it's interesting because it's, m it's different than the, the regular graphics that you are, uh, rational graphics that you are mm, comfortable with. And then, for example, we, this, we have this like, event, Twitch plays Pokemon, which was really crazy because like, the, the chaos, like the noise of players uh, in the internet played one game and there was like an, a fight between like, for example, if you can go up or down and they were actually playing it with success. So let's uh, look, take a look at uh, irrational numbers from the mathematics point of view. So if we have a multiplication of irrational numbers, then we still got a irrational number. But we can magnify them with the magnify operator, like the, the, the power of two, and then the irrational piece gets, we can get rid of that, and we have like a very natural idea. And God Simulator is a really good example of that, because what they did is they taken like the goat as a game character, which is like quite irrational, and then they've taken the glitches and bugs of the games that appear to all us, of us developers, which I'm sure you all have a lot of fun from that. But this was hidden to just developers, like normal people didn't know about those glitches, how funny are they? So 
if they taken those two pieces like and they magnified it to the way that it's like the main selling point of the game that they got gold simulator which is really rational idea and then in the end we have the transcendental numbers so the those numbers are the remaining part of the set so they are not countable it is impossible to to count those and write them on the on the sheet of paper and any number except zero the zero is a problem <laughs> multiplied or divided by a transcendental number makes it transcendental so for example we have this equation over here 2 pi uh, uh, 2 multiplied by e to the power of 4 and divided by irrational number times another transcendental numbers it's still transcendental so basically if you will get a transcendental idea and you will connect it to the other ideas then this piece will stay there and will um, like be very dominant in the whole equation so what what are these um, ideas so transcendental numbers represent universal values so for example happiness or sadness or family or being together and being alone or finally a, met a life as a metaphor and transforming yourself into evil with the um, this is like apocalypse now but it's actually just another version of um, the, the seed of darkness. Oh, okay, uh, maybe I will still stay here on, on this piece for a, li a little bit longer. So basically, if you have this um, idea that is like a seed of darkness, and you make you make it another different, like a movie or game around that idea of changing yourself and understanding evil, then this element will stay there. And no matter how it looks, it's just like a com completely different thing that's uh, not presented in the, in the book, or except like the uh, running on the river. Uh, then th this element is pretty visible. So we can still make, choose a universal value and start from that and make a game about it. But after like the previous talk that, that we did, we, we were, had a discussion. It's best to have like concentrate on one universal values and not try to mix a couple of them because it may, it may be too, too confusing. Okay, so I will talk a little bit about uh, a game that we are creating and I will try to show the evolution of how it was created. So actually it's pretty easy from that point of my point of view that um, today when I stand and I have like we have the game mostly complete, then I can write down this factorization of ideas and probably it's much easier than to start from the ideas and try to make a game ab about that. But let's, let's go. So we, we, uh, the bound started with a universal uh, value. So I had an idea in my head that I would like to make a game about uh, some kind of topic, which I won't tell what this topic is about because I will spoil the game. And then we have taken the 3D platformer. In, uh, in this case, it's like um, a 3D Mario World, but basically we've taken the mechanics of the 3D platformer and removed the gaming parts. So the gaming parts are like element, uh, elements typical to games, like games, points, um, coins, um, whatever you would like, which is like a pure game, like a character evolution. And then, we, so, so this, to, uh, this is like a transcendental number. This is like a, uh, let's say, it, it may be a 3D platformer, it's not a prime number, it's like a huge natural number that came by evolution of first Mario, it extended to 3D and so on. And then um, this gaming mechanism, let's say it's like a prime number, the game mechanics, we divided it 
and we have this irrational idea. So uh, in our game, the, look, look, uh, the world looks a little bit blocky, and it's because we actually started from visualizing the design blocks, like the collision boxes, and then I, I was thinking that, wow, it looks lo really cool, and actually we'll not have too many assets, we don't need to mesh th this around, it's really easy, like a very tiny piece of structure, and uh, so we've made like a regular shading on that and it looked pretty cool and then we started to think that it's like so flexible this like piece is so flexible that we can like uh, distort it in like any geometrical way and we started to do that so basically from very irrational idea to take the collision boxes and just use them because we don't have time and or meshes or artists to do any, uh, anything about it it started and then we've chosen like modern art because these blocky pieces like started to look like modern art. For example, like a Mondrian or like a, you know, suprematism. For example, the, the black square on the white background. And we started to g dig around uh, about this modern art thing. <laughs> And finally, we, I think that the whole team understands right now why the piece of painting, which consists only from uh, red paint, can cost millions of dollars. And late in the development, we've added this dancing element, which currently is uh, the thing that mm, drives the, the whole game. So basically, if you will uh, see our game on the floor, you can say that it's a game about the ballerina. And this came very lately into production. So we've made the character and we've made the basic movement and we got the feedback that, okay, the game is fine, uh, you can like walk around, but it looks like a game character. So what kind of feedback is that? We, we, make, we are making a game and we get a feedback that this character is, looks like a game character. It's really bad, actually, because there's like a 100 games coming out every day. And if you will not, st not stand out from it, then you will just disappear. And then uh, my friend uh, showed me like a, a music video with a dancing girl and I was thinking that from from this transcendental idea, it's like what I would like to uh, say about like the mental state of our character, it perfectly fits our game. So then we've added this dancing element and we got this. Easy. <laughs> no, easy from now if I can make it backwards factorization. And let's say that what I was f uh, saying before, it looks and feels like it's like 3D platformer with ballerina, but there's actually a shift in there. And if you will play the game, I, I hopefully will find you interested and you will check it out, what it is. So let's, to, to sum everything up. Um, currently there's a big interest in video games medium evolution, so you probably heard this on every talk <laughs> that there was today, so it's like getting bigger and bigger and bigger. But this is done by uh, mixing ideas and removing the pieces and trying to find the natural or irrational ideas. So, so basically everything does the things that I was presenting on my talk, but it was not like characterized or put together into like one readable form and I used numbers for that. And 99%, I, I really used that number, <laughs> which is really sad and hurts me a lot, that 99.99% uh, .99 of released games does not contain any universal values at all. So basically those are just like a pure games without any content. It's a pure form. And this is really bad if you compare it to books and movies. And those games that contain universal values or uh, utilize new natural ideas, so new prime numbers, like for example the, the super hot game, like mechanics, are being watched by industry representatives instantly, and those are game developers. So basically, if you will make a game that has one element that nobody else seen before, you will immediately get the, the press around you, they will write about your game, from no reason, you, d you won't need to pay for that. There, uh, there will be like a huge interest of other game developers because they would like to take that prime number from you and mix it with other numbers 
<laughs> Actually, sometimes they take this whole big number and just copy it, <laughs> which is really bad. But if you will factorize your game into prime ideas, let's say you, you have this idea and this and this and this, and use different operators uh, on them, try to remove and put it, like make it on paper, I think you can find something that will be different from the other games and your game will stand out. And that the new target audience that I think that start to emerge are the game developers. It's something common in movies. So there's a lot of movie makers and there's a lot of movie makers that make movies for other movie makers. And like general public doesn't like that because they say like in a pejorative way that it's like, uh, it's the movie that they only uh, understand. But actually if this target audience is big, like five million registered Unity developers, and if we will say that 20 of percent of this number is actually people <laughs> and not robots or like multiple accounts and so on, uh, and that's 47% of the market share. It's still a huge number. And developers need to learn if they, would, if they want to stay on the, on the market, they need to lot a, no, uh, a lot of games. They need to know that. So they need to research. And if you have those prime, prime numbers in your game, which are really unique, then they will check it out. Yes, they, they will search for those prime numbers. And finally, they like easy tweet about that. So for example, like there was Firewatch released recently. I think that they didn't have like too much of marketing budget, but if you've checked on Twitter, there was like a storm of information about Firewatch when it was released. So, so basically that's, that's the, the, the end of my talk. If you have any question, I would like to like answer them. We have just a couple of minutes more. Yeah. Thank you, Michal. And we have a question already, so... Yeah, thank you. So, uh, that is very interesting. Uh, actually, I had a very similar, like, look on the ideas, general, generally. Uh, but uh, the question is, because, you know, the pattern that you showed and you know, the ideas on, like, emerging the ideas um, can lead you to a situation where, you know, you make something new that is, or some idea that is unique, but is actually not fun. Yes, of course. So the question, actually, there are, there are two questions. Uh, looking at maybe your experience with, with the approach, um, do you find, like, if, if we take your approach, are we going? Are we going to? Um, are we going to uh, produce something that is r rather fun or rather not fun? And if we're going to produce something that is not fun, how to use your approach? to actually produce something that is fun and not to... Okay, okay I, I, I understand what mm -hmm. you're trying to say. So, so the, our previous game was called Datura and it had like a, a, a lot of content in terms like of those values that I was talking about, but the biggest problem with that was the controls. So uh, there was like a lack of fun in that and that was like a mistake that we did. So when we were thinking about uh, making bound, the first thing that we did was making a, a controls work perfectly. So for example, if you have Fire, Firewatch, and uh, they've taken the uh, like f uh, first person perspective mechanics, and that's it. So this is something that is already working, and this is like the fun factor in terms of, okay, this will not be broken, so this will not stop the players, and then, you add on top of that another ideas, and basically you play test. So we play test all the time, like week after week, and we, when we add those ideas, we try to try it out, because it's really hard with such a lot of ideas 
to know if it's a fan or not. You know about it probably. It's you just need to test it and test it and test it. Mm -hmm. And who, who are you chos choosing to test? Because sometimes uh, like uh, hardcore gamers, developers are not necessarily those who understand what is fun. Yeah, so, so basically we test with uh, an, any kind of people. So the, the players are uh, one type of people, which is like they can stand a lot of problems with controls. But then we, for example, take people on the corridor from other offices and so on. It's like invite them to, to play something and like completely random people. But I think that you need to start from your friends because like the, the, uh, your friends will not be afraid to tell you that the game sucks and your family also. For example, my wife. She tells that all the time. <laughs> if you need to test the game, go to the Michal's wife. Um, uh, okay, we have two... <laughs> uh, we have a question here. Uh, hello. Uh, I want to know in your equation uh, when you take uh, on account the target audience. Or the target audience is some product of, of the operation. Ah, so I'd uh, like to... Um, have like a target audience inside the equation. Yeah, that, that, that's, <laughs> like I said, it's like a mental exercise. I would need to think about it, but it's, it's a, like an interesting approach like to put that into the equation. Okay, so I, I will leave that question unanswered. <laughs> okay, so work still to be done. Uh, the far away question. Mm, hello, uh, I have a question regarding uh, fun in general because there seems to me that there is this idea in game development that games are meant to be fun, primarily, and I can see in other mediums that this is not their primary goal. Um, and I wanted to ask, what do you think about making games that are not necessarily made just for fun, but more like an experience and um, can provide you, like, uh, I mean, are, are, like the game, you're, you're the, the bound game is um, more about an, like an idea, like I said, but it's not necessarily just about fun. So I wanted to ask uh, like a general question. Do you think that games are meant to be fun or more like the medium is like okay. basically going towards a... Um, okay, so that, that's a good question. But then we'll first need to define what fun is. It's so relative. It's really relative. For example, if I will tell you what kind of movies I like... <laughs> They, uh, I don't know you. Maybe you like the same movies, but I really uh, like those very experimental, like short movies, like small movies, or like an indie movies, because I find those new things in there which are like amazing for me, and this is like a pure fun. And on the other hand, someone else will say it's like ah, it's like late evening. I was working for the whole day. I don't have like mental, like I'm, I'm not pre prepared mentally for that. So I will. Uh, watch something that is like easy and fun. So this is very relative. Like for me, fun is completely different than for you. And basically, it's like a target audience here. We have this target audience again, and it's really hard to answer. So yes, the the game should be fun, but is it fun for you? So basically, if you are making a game for someone or you are game, uh, making a game that you would like to play. And then you have like your definition of fun, and then concentrate on that. On, on that. So if I take my definition of fun and make a game on that definition, then, for example, 100 people in the world will play it. But still, it's fun for those 100 people. It's, I think it's a question that it's really hard to answer because mm -hmm. fun is really hard to define. It's not an objective term, it's a subjective term, yeah? It's yes. Okay. Hi, so I think that maybe not uh, the question what is fun is not the right question, but the question what people want to play, what they want to experience. They may want to experience something that will be not fun for them. And the other thing, uh, uh, I heard uh, about ratios, that they come from the word relation, that is how one thinks relate to others. So this is it. Oh, uh, this is a comment, rather. Yeah, like uh, I, I, I think that I didn't understand the question because the, the speakers. No, ah. it, it was a comment ah, that okay, uh, ratio comment. comes okay. from relation word. So maybe this is something that it's intellectually interesting yeah. for you. So, so basically, I think that mm, 
I was like talking about Firewatch uh, ten times probably, but this is a good game because uh, it's a game that is like a slice of life. So we have like a dramas in TV, which is like a, a common things uh, in TVs and movies, and there's not too many games of that. And uh, Firewatch has proven that if there would be more games of that kind, then I would play that. But they're actually not too many, so so um, I hope that this will like evolve, and um, they their sales number are really huge for this kind of game. So I really hope that other people will try to copy that success. To copy that success, not copy the game, but that success. Okay. Do we have any question more? Uh, so this will be last question. Okay. So now that you sort of described the theory for like m mushing up ideas together and so on, uh, don't you feel that uh, it's we, we could be just a, like a small step away from like when the fun or what is interesting and stimulating if it could be quantified? Don't you? Feel that we are just a tiny little step away from this being turned into an algorithm, this being automated, like inventing new ideas for within, with an AI, or actually like mixing and mashing up ideas okay, I, with I will, AI. I will answer you with that picture over here. So this is like an Andromeda galaxy, but if we would think that this is our galaxy, then uh, this is our sun here. <laughs> and I think that there's like a tons of ideas that we need to find those prime numbers, like for example, virtual reality headsets. And if, if we will see if that, that works, but actually those games that are coming for headsets, like especially designed for VR, there are new genres that didn't exist before. So those prime numbers are popping, 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 and I think that we've really found a little tiny piece of that. And we'll see what the future will, will show us. Okay, so for now it seems that uh, game uh, designers are, uh, shouldn't be afraid of uh, work automation in their <laughs> field. Um, okay, so uh, the last question I uh, try to ask all our presenters here in Hall A is, um, uh, is about advice uh, for uh, younger developers or people who are starting their adventure in game design. And it's, uh, it's difficult because your whole speech was kind of uh, um, uh, um, advice uh, taking the um, long run. But what would you say, how to start um, I'm, I'm seeing here familiar faces from uh, game jams in Krakow that we had last time. 100 people creating games, uh, new ideas, stuff like that. Um, do you have any advice for...? Yes. <laughs> it, 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 it may be a rough advice, <laughs> but I, I'm, now, I'm known for be, uh, like having a rough uh, like visions of, of things. So I will say that people have to play a lot of games not just a one game for like five years, like one type of game. They just need to see a lot of games, including those games that are on uh, retro computers like C64, Mario, Nintendo, check all the platforms if they can. There's like tons of emulators. Check it out, see what was done before already, because we are already starting to make the same things again because there was, the, the people forgot about that and it was done before a lot of times. And if you will have this knowledge like of everything, then it will be easier for you to find something that was not done before. Okay, okay. and understanding what made those games good or bad, yeah, so to, to, to know and understand. Uh, so, so maybe a helpful hint, where do you find most inspiring games? Like, there are tons of pages uh, in the, on, on the internet, so what is your favorite? Like, if you had to uh, recommend one website where, or blog or blogger or something like that, where you find the, the biggest amount of interesting games for you personally? Twitter. <laughs> Twitter. <laughs> just Twitter. And just to follow the, the right like people that ag agglomerate stuff. And if you have the similar taste to them, then they will just show you the stuff that you like. And it's like, for me, it's currently the, the best thing. And like the communities inside like forums and so on so um, it's really hard to say that I don't read like regular media 
I stopped reading the regular media. Let's good say good like, for you, uh, yeah, by the way. Yeah, but, but <laughs> maybe it's because I'm a developer, but, but still uh, I think that's like ha having the information from the first hand, like from the other developers, if you follow them and they say like this stuff and then, it will be easier than okay. like trying to get out so from the So are noise. you active on Twitter also? Yes, I'm, I'm on Twitter. So let's, uh, let's, end up with, let's end up with recommending to follow Michal uh, on, uh, it was on the last uh, last slide. Last slide. <laughs> um, uh, recommending the the following you on Twitter. I imagine that you post um, uh, post some interesting stuff. <laughs> let's this <Okay>, be. Try. <laughs> let, let's this be the the last um, uh, call of this presentation. Please join me giving thanks to Michal, uh, giving him loud applause. Thank you.